pleasure to be able to stand <laughs> after four weeks of therapy. So uh, let us uh, bow and uh, remember why we're here. We're here to save the children in this district, and we must make those decisions based on, on our kids. It's not based on anything else. It's just based on being here and doing what's right for children. And there's a lot of things that happened in the last month, and I don't mean just myself, but we got an election. You all got a chance to vote. Voted. Sometimes it works out for you, and sometimes it doesn't. And, uh, and it might have worked out for you. I don't know what, what, what side you voted on. But right now, we need to heal the nation. And we need to come together and heal this nation. And uh, it's been a decisive type of battle for the last year or two. So remember that. We'll have a moment of silent prayer. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If I get up and I walk around, don't worry about it. I'm not upset with anybody on the board or anything else. It's my time to get up and walk around. Mr. Murray, knee surgery, so that's what he's referring to. Mr. Murray, could you get up and walk just to the front? Would that be okay? So, yeah, I guess I can do that. Mr. Murray, just in the hospital after the knee surgery, I think I control what's going on there, too, just like you did. <laughs> it was in there, everything. It, it's been an incredible pleasure, very nice for both of you, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, excellent human being, excellent board member, and uh, totally, uh, totally dedicated to the system. I have a plaque for you, and I want to read it to you. Ms. Everett Bill Murray III, an appreciation for your commitment, dedication, and professionalism as a Citrus County School Board member. You always do what is best for the children. of the agenda as recommended by the superintendent. Move approval. Second. It's been moved by Ms. Ryan, seconded by Mr. Kennedy to adopt the agenda as recommended by the superintendent. Do we have any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries 5 0. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, we have citizen comments, and I want to read something um, about that. The first citizen comments are reserved for items requesting approval of vote by the board on the agenda. Then at six o'clock, the second opportunity is given for any other comments would like to, that a uh, person would like to make. Let me read the, the uh, uh, statement concerning the public speakers who come up. And it's worded uh, to cover all possibilities. Each listed speaker will be allowed three minutes to make the presentation. Speakers are asked to address the issue at hand and refrain from using obscenities, vulgarities, or other breaches of respect and refrain from words or statements which from their usual construction and common acceptance are constructed, construed excuse me, as insults intended to incite violence or breach of the peace. We ask that you model the following character traits. Cooperation, responsibility, citizenship, kindness, respect, honesty, self-control, and tolerance. The school board will not discuss or take official action on any presentation. Any persons present who wish to speak must fill out a green card, and the green cards are located in the back of the room. Um, the first citizen comment 
Are there any people in the audience who wish to address something that uh, is on the agenda for approval? If, if, I, I, I'm not sure. Is D5, is that one that you're... Mm -hmm. No, which uh, which one are you referring to? This item on the agenda is one of the local Okay, I, I'm missing it then. Okay, sorry. Oh no, that would be that would come at six o'clock. That's not. Uh, it's on the agenda. It's, it's on the agenda. agenda. Yes. Not for approval. It's on the agenda. It's on the agenda. And that is the one that will occur at six o'clock, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, it's on the regular. Agenda. On the okay, then I, then I didn't look at the right one. Okay. You need a green card then. Okay. You need to bring it up and give it to Elizabeth. Um, okay. Good afternoon. My name is Jeanette Collins. I'm Director of Land Development Division with the Board of County Commissioners, and I'm actually here on behalf of uh, Vincent Cotero, who's Director of Planning and Development Department, and Eric Williams, who actually is here. He's Director of Geographic Systems and Community Planning Division, and these gentlemen had sent letters that were received by the school board leading to Mr. Dixon's listed um, Roman numeral 5D5 on your agenda for your discussion regarding the three items the Interlocal Agreement for Public Educational Facility Planning in Citrus County, two, school concurrency, and three, the impact fees. The letters were made following a motion by the Board of County Commissioners on September 25th of this year for staff to work with the school board to modify the Interlocal Agreement, including school concurrency, and to address the school board's position on school impact fees and whether they should be suspended. I know Mr. Williams has supplied you with uh, the draft general local agreement. He's here also. I'm basically here to answer questions, and I apologize on behalf of Mr. Cotero, who had a conflict and could not be here himself. Um, but essentially, I'm here to answer any questions and take your position back to the county. Thank you. Thank you. Pat White. Good afternoon, honorable board members staff. I'm a proud product of Florida public schools. I was born in Florida. I'm no stranger to citrus. I purchased land here 36 years ago. My husband and I built a home in citrus and moved here to live full time four years ago. Yes, I paid my impact fees and I didn't mind at all. I earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry, PhD in biochemistry. As a research scientist, I was involved with a program sponsored by the American Heart Association to mentor high school students in our research labs. I chaired that program for many years, and I loved it. When I retired, I ran for office and served eight years as a councilwoman. A big part of my duties was zoning and land use decisions. It was there that I experienced the other, less pleasant side of school life. I saw schools with 180% capacity. I saw lunch schedules begin at 10 a.m. I saw closets and storage rooms being counted as teaching space to make the numbers look better, at least on paper. This is a hole that no school system should be in. Finally, school concurrency was adopted by the local planning, by the uh, commission, and things began to get better. School concurrency belongs, least we find ourselves back in those dark days. It can happen anywhere when new residential construction overwhelms school capacity. Concurrency helps to prevent that. You must keep concurrency as a valuable planning tool. 
Of course, the other piece of the puzzle is impact fees. These fees dictate that new residential construction pays for the impact that it creates on schools. It gives school systems the fiscal ability to keep pace with growth. Lowering or omitting impact fees is not economic development. It's just the opposite. People and businesses move to an area for many reasons, good schools being one of them. Which is the worst case scenario for economic development? A one-time fee on new construction or a forever increase in ad valorem taxes? Which is worse? This is a fact-based board. Uh, so, we're getting to the end of your time. If you could, uh, I will give you some facts. If you could uh, just maybe take about five more seconds. There's no reputable study to support getting rid of either impact fees or concurrency, and I urge you to keep them both. Thanks so much. Randy Clark. Randy Clark, Clark Construction, Crystal River. I am a builder, so I see this from a little bit different um, side. Uh, a couple things is on school concurrency, school concurrency has only been around for, I think, about six years now, and, and the state has, has lowered its requirements, has gotten rid of the requirements for that statewide mandate. That's the reason why we're looking at doing away with that. We're not asking that an interlocal agreement be done away with because we understand there needs to be the communication between the communities and the school board in order to know where there's going to be growth so that those things can be planned for in the future. There's no, there's no question that those, that those things need to happen. What we're not having in Citrus County is a humongous amount of growth. What I don't, I mean, uh, and what we have is we have an interlocal agreement that is supposed to be uh, you know, there's certain things that are supposed to happen in that interlocal agreement on an annual basis that haven't been happening, and we need to, that's why we need to update it, we need to update the information in the interlocal agreement, that's what we're asking for. Um, one of the other things is, is on the impact fee, we're not going to do away with, we're not asking to do away with the impact fee, we're asking for a moratorium for a period of time. And this is nothing more than, and I'll go on record as saying, I don't think if we roll back, an impact fee for a short short period of time that it's going to turn into a housing boom. All I'm looking at is a goodwill gesture by this board uh, with the builders in this area, which a lot of them have children, they're in the school system, and we're all hurting right now. This, I mean, the whole community, we're all part of the community, and right now we have growth in this county that is, uh, I mean, it's, it's terribly low growth. You guys see it in the number of students that you have. Um, you know, there's low growth with the number of students, <coughs> low growth um, for us building houses, and uh, it's, it's a tough time. So if we could all pull together and look at saying, you know what, in your five-year plan, you don't have any plan on spending your impact fee dollars. So if you're not even planning, if you're not planning on where those expenses are going, maybe it's a time where we can see something eye to eye, hold hands, and work towards coming together and work towards doing something for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another one? No more. Okay. I thought someone just came up to the one. Okay, did you? Would you give it to the lady? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Theodora Rusnak for the Citrus County Council. We've been monitoring this thing for a very, very long time. The issue of impact fees is not new to this county. The issue of concurrency is not new to this county. The council has consistently had the uh, policy. We have taken the stance that new growth should be paying for itself. It's not going to pay 100% for itself, but it should be kicking in. As Dr. Wade indicated, the choice we saw has been between a one-time fee 
to people who buy new homes in the county versus an ongoing and ever escalating um, ad valorem taxes. We feel that the issue is that for uh, school concurrency and impact fees, this should stay in place. What we have seen from the uh, county's position from Mr. Cotero's department, a um, not a good faith gesture. Uh, the Builders Association is talking about this being a good faith gesture on your part. We would question that the idea of simply sending in a um, former agreement that had been arrived at on a bilateral basis and having that by a sister organization, governmental level, just crossing out everything and gutting it is not an indication of a good faith effort on the part of the county. We're troubled by that in the council. We are the homeowners in the county. And very frankly, the Builders Association addresses this topic and has for decades as though the only housing choices in the county are brand new built homes. Now, I would suggest to you that there's a whole lot of us who do own homes that would gladly put them up for uh, resale. A resale home does not carry any impact fees. If a $2,000 impact fee for schools is what's keeping a new homeowner from buying a new home, then especially in light of the recent housing debacle, I would respectfully suggest that maybe that home buyer not buy that home. There are other choices and we should keep those options open so that when growth does return to this county, and we are a beautiful place to live and growth will come back again, but that when that happens, you are prepared and not trying to meet some unusual timelines to get things moving along legislatively or within the, uh, the county realm to get your, yourself reinstated with your concurrency and impact fees. So we strongly recommend, as the homeowners of Citrus County, that you stick by the decisions with the current uh, interlocal agreement and, um, and move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any other green cards? And would you introduce yourself? Uh, yes, good morning, uh, good afternoon, board members. Karen Esty. Um, I just recently moved here. I'm a, a newbie here in Citrus County from Miami Dade, in which Dr. Wade, uh, her and I were uh, neighbors. And I so too was on Miami Dade County Zoning Appeals Board and heard zoning issues for the entire county there. And it was not a pretty picture when it came to um, the explosion of development that took place in our county. And it just seems like we were packing in and packing in houses and there was no money available for new school buildings. There was no money for roads. I just want to urge this board that I, as a new homeowner here, would like to see my taxes go towards something else other than raising them to have to come for you when it's really not necessary at this point. And I've always said never say never and never say ever. Because this county is a beautiful place. You have a good school system in. I keep reading your papers and all the fine jobs you've done for your students here. You go over and above. You have good accountability for your money. Keep the good work up, keep your impact fees, and keep your concurrency going. It's, it's really necessary. You're going to get people moving here because you have a quality of life, not quantity of life. In addition to that, I saw major, major corporations bail out of Dade County. Writer Systems, for one, they just couldn't deal with it anymore down there for a number of reasons. But the people who come with major corporations one of their main focuses is where are my children going to go to school? And how are we going to get them there? And what's the quality of those schools? Keep the good work up, keep your impact fees in place, and keep your concurrency in place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other green cards? Okay. <clears throat> Th 
Thank you. We'll next move on to approve the consent agenda. Move approval. Second. It's been moved by excuse me, Ms. Bryant, second by Mr. Jim, to approve the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries 5-0. Thank you. Right. Donation recognition. We have several donations for today. First one is a thousand dollar donation to the Renaissance Center for Home Assassin Game and Fish Club. A two thousand a donation of a two thousand Mazda minivan from Richard Wayne Grabel to the WTI Automotive Services Technology Program. Blue book value seventeen fifty. Approve a donation value to one thousand eighty eight dollars to Emerson Middle School from Office Max. One thousand dollar donation to the Kenton High School from Williams and Betty Owens Trust. Beth L. Jones, trustee, $5,795.17 donations to the Kansas High School from Raymond James Company, $1,000 donations to Citrus High School from Aaron de Bocala, a $932 donation to Home Assassin Elementary School from Christopher River Moose Lodge in Home Assassin, Cypress 202 Moose Legion, approve a large donation of clothes, personal hygiene, and school supplies, including a $412 check. With an approximate value of six thousand dollars to Home Assassin Elementary School, Christopher Moose Lodge, and Home Assassin, Cypress 202 Moose Legion. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, and thank all the people who've donated to the school system. As you were mentioning, we have the public has an interest, and the public is supportive, and we very much appreciate it. Moving on, uh, Mr. Blocker. <coughs> Mr. Burke, I think he's going to come up and speak. Is it? While oh, Mr. Burkhoff is coming up, I'm I going to abstain from voting for Senate to Florida Statute 112.3143 as I perceive a potential conflict in this matter. Thank you. I'm here to ask you to approve Crystal River High change orders 15 for phase one and 14 for phase two. I move approval of Crystal River High School change order 15 for phase one and 14 for phase two. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Kennedy, second by Mr. Murray, to approve the Crystal River change orders 15 for phase one and 14 for phase two. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries 4-0. Okay, next, next on the agenda, please. Yes, ma'am. We have the amendment. This will be the amendment of the series 2010A and series 2010. Uh, 10B bond resolutions. And essentially, the nutshell is taking the balance that was remaining in the Christopher River Primary School bond and transferring it over for use at the high school. That's what that all means in a nutshell. So, what, what is it? Sorry. And that's just going to be included in our, in our revenues for the high school project? Correct. That's going to be used to help pay for the remainder of the, the project at hand that we're, we're doing the phase two that should be through first part of the year. Um, and it's going to use up all those available funds? Correct. Okay. Ms. Blocker, when all said and done um, with Crystal River, both Crystal River projects, um, our debt service will be what and for how long? Well, the total will be the 47, uh, you know, the original 35 at Christopher High and 12 for 47. We had five, we have a five year note bond payment at Christopher Primary School, and then we have uh, 16 years of the high school. And when is the first, uh, the, the Christopher River uh, Primary one? We've been paying on it for the last two years. So, so we have about three years left on right. And then we deferred uh, principal on the first five years of the high school while we paid the primary school off, and then we will pay the remainder over the next, uh, for the 16th and the original start date, so. And the interest rate after our discounts? Essentially, we sold the bonds at approximately 6.75. We get about a 5.75 uh, subsidy back from the uh, IRS. And then we can also, we also have an invested seeking fund. So essentially the cost of issuance and the interest was uh, almost nil. I mean, it was very, very little. Thank you, Mr. Buck. Mm -hmm. I'll ask Mr. Bradshaw, I'm mean, going to read the uh, top portion. Must I read the whole uh, portion here? Yeah, we can just read the, the top portion. Good, thank you. Okay. Uh, may, may I have a... A vote, or not a vote, excuse me, a motion. Um, the amendment to series uh, 2010A and series 2010B bond resolution. 
So, <clears throat> Mr. Bradshaw, do you want us to read the um, the entire resolution? No, he said we just had to read the no, top portion. The entire resolution, which the, uh, As a motion? Yes. Yeah. Consider the resolution authorizing the school board to enter into the series when we read the whole thing. On our, okay, we'll have the chairman. I'm just going to okay. we approve the uh, bond resolution. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Dorsham, second by Mr. Kennedy, uh, to approve the consideration <coughs> of a resolution authorizing the school board to enter into an amendment to series 2010A ground leasing amended and restated schedule 2010A in order to transfer the amounts remaining in the series 2010B acquisition account created in connection with the financing of Crystal River Primary School from proceeds of the series 2010B certificates of participation to the series 2010A acquisition account created in connection with the financing of Crystal River High School Phase 1 and proceeds of the series 2010A certificates of participation to be used together with funds remaining in the series 2010A acquisition agreement to provide funds for the financing of a portion of the project designated as Crystal River High School Phase 2. Discussion. I thought we had, we were covering all of Phase 2 with our additional money that we got in the bonds. Do we have any coming out of our capital outlay funds? No, it's all through the bond process. So, so how is this money going to be used? To complete what we've already started out there through the Phase 2. Phase 2 in conjunction, I think, Already left, it's probably about 37 that gave me in total for everything. Mm -hmm. Where we only where we say to the primary school, we say I think we spent about 10 million there, so we're just using the balance just to pay off the, the uh, rest of phase two. I, I thought it was fully funded though, that's why I don't understand how we're going to use this money. How is it not fully funded to begin with? When we approved phase two, right? We had all change the orders, we've done a lot of we've done a lot of changes, we've got did some additions and you know of course the modification but it was a little bit it did cost us a little bit more when we did the phase one phase two than what we had originally anticipated so we knew <laughs> at the beginning of the onset after we got into the primary school and did all that bidding remember we originally came out a little bit cheaper in the, in the beginning so we had some extra proceeds right. that when this day came we could just transfer over okay so this is all we're doing yes this is what we've already talked about that's correct oh, yeah it. there's nothing there's nothing new okay right okay. all right that wasn't clear thanks <laughs> Okay, and uh, Ms. Bryant, you were going to not vote on this. You I'm not. Do not, and you, you need to announce it again. I don't think she's already did. Okay. 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 <laughs> I'm ready for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries four zero. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. The next item is the, the uh, approval of the disposal of the active surplus property list. I pulled that, um, and I can't find it right now because I. Oh, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, but really, all I, I thanks. Um, these were a lot of lap laptops. It wasn't the laptops in particular that I really pulled this for, but it was uh, the conversations that I've been having um, at our schools when they go visit and talk about um, Skyward <coughs> and the um, parent portal, which I had a demonstration of the other day, which was pretty impressive. Um, and. We, we know that there's schools that are in pockets where people don't have internet at their house. And we also know that not everybody in the world has a computer or internet at their home. Um, and this is a valuable tool for parents, and it's also essential that they have access to it and not be pre precluded from having access to it because they don't have the internet. So my question was, could we set up little internet cafes for parents to use and make them very available? Oh. Uh, for parents, and uh, one school said, oh, well, you can come to the library, but it's on the second floor. I'm thinking more in terms of lobby, mm -hmm. you know, where the parents don't even have to check in. Um, you can just come into the lobby, log on, and um, look up your students' records, look at their grades, see if they actually did their homework, um, all the kinds of things that Skyward's going to provide, um, but make it really easily accessible to parents who don't have that, or just while they're waiting in line when they come in. And, and, and look stuff up. And this would be you just clean these off and just give them internet access. So they don't, we don't have to worry about our usual concerns about the software licenses and all those things. I wonder though if we have ones that are, because some of these I think I saw, they were down in they're 2004. Old, yeah. So I mean, they're like uh, Windows XP probably. Well, I have Windows XP, so it works. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Well, uh, <laughs> But I'm wondering if we have, if we actually have on sites maybe one where we could put that over. 
Dr. Gaddis, what, I mean, uh, this is not like I'm saying specifically for this list, but we always have the ongoing list of computers that, we're, that we are taking out of service. And um, I'm just That's wondering right. if maybe we should be thinking in terms of recycling them to ourselves to provide this to our parents. How about if we do this? Can I offer? Because I really do know I, th those computers are pretty old. How about if we look at possibly looking at some computers that we have that we might be able to relocate and put up in our uh, offices mm -hmm. that would be more uh, com compatible with internet access there and then have like those kiosks that you mentioned in those offices in the office. Well, would you be lobby. taking a computer away from them? Well, we can kind of look at that. I, I, again, this is the first time we've inventory. I'm sorry? You may have the existing inventory. Yeah, I'd like the opportunity to review that with the schools that we have and see what the resources with Dr. Geddes' input okay. as far as that. But I really think it's a good idea, a good kiosk. Well, the, uh, and, and I guess, you know, I, I certainly don't want to tell schools how to set it up, but when I hear that a parent would have to come into the school, check in, go to the library, I'm thinking we're not making the access very readily available to people. If you want to just pop in and do it uh, without having to even, even go through the process of you know getting your name tag and all that, why would we mm -hmm. do that? And because we have Wi-Fi at our schools, laptops kind of made a little bit of sense. Sure, we can start that at the high school and the middle school. And you know, too, with a kiosk, um, I think, and, and Dr. Guest probably knows, I think for like less than $10, they can also have a privacy, just the, the virtual part of privacy screen. So if we were concerned that someone couldn't look from an angle, they're not, they're not one that you see, they're just one that covers it, but to make sure that our student, but we can, I think, accomplish that. I mean, it's a very inexpensive thing where you have to be looking dead on. And Is that we can explore that? Oh. But you're concerned about where those computers would come from. And I think, Mr. Clark, we, we'd ask for the middle school to set up a computer in the front office so, uh, so parents could access different information, so it would just be the same thing. And it was a, it's a great idea to do yeah, that, I think. think. Three yeah. five, you would see minimum, you know. Especially if, if, you know, one of the, the things that we talked about at the advisory council training is how to get parents involved. Does that mean that they have to physically build, be in your building doing something? Or can they be involved from a distance? Or can we get them involved through using the internet and the website and this parent portal so that they have access to their students' information um, without the restrictions of, of not having the ability for whatever reason from their own home? And even if we found one, we put one in each school's lobby, and then we found that was getting used all the time, we could keep it. And kind of monitor that usage in the yeah. office. All right? It's all right with me. I think, I think that's, that's a good question. question. That's I think it's great. It's good. Do we have a motion? Um, all right. Well, so we didn't make a decision about this prop, but you'll look at maybe possibly using these if you can or some other computers. Yes. Yeah, he said yes. Okay, fine. Okay, I'll, <laughs> with that, then I'll move the approval of the disposable, disposal of active surplus property with um, the caveat that if these can be used um, for parent um, access, they'll, they'll be put into that use instead. Second. It's been moved by Ms. Dorsey and second by Mrs. Bryant to approve the disposal of active surplus property with the caveat that if uh, the surplus property could be used for parent access at school or needed to be used, and we would, we would all do that too. Do I have, um, ready for a vote? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries 5 zero. Thank you. Next, quarterly investment performance reports. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is for information purposes only, it's just to go uh, over some of the investments that we have within our long-term portfolio. If we look at section C1, that'll kind of give us a little bit of highlights. Uh, we currently have about fifteen and a half million dollars invested, and our quarterly return for this quarter was uh, 0.26% against the benchmark of 0.25. And the calendar year day, we've uh, earned 0.64% against the uh, benchmark of 0.43, and then the last year we're up 0.83% against the 0.63 of the uh, portfolio of the uh, our uh, our index that we we measure against. So. We are outperforming currently the uh, Merle Lynch one to three. That's what we uh, are pacing ourselves against. And the duration actually mimics 1.77 years of that benchmark. So, so we're doing better than Merle Lynch? So. Well, that is a benchmark that we use at one to three, yes. And then if you look at the next page, it kind of gives you a breakdown of what we have out there. About 7.3 million, 7.4 million in treasuries, and a little over 8 million in federal agencies. We 
go to page F1, you'll kind of see the entire portfolio for the district. We still have about 2.6 million in SBA, both uh, A and B fund, uh, 7.4 in treasuries, lower eight in federal instrumentalities, and then in our bank accounts, about 24 million day-to-day -day operations in, and uh, money market investing. Any, any questions? Ma'am? We're rolling in our investment money, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, unfortunately, we're pretty limited on what we can do. Oh, yeah. and, uh, we're doing the best we can. No soybeans or anything like uh, that. Pork valley. No futures. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have the financial statement for September 2012 for informational purposes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. A lot of the um, discrepancies that you may see between last year and this year in revenues and expenditures are primarily due to timing. You'll see on the general fund, the ROTC and the federal through state, the Medicaid program, they're all down as compared to last year, but again, it's just a timing issue as far as when the money comes in. The ROTC program had a new staff, had to file paperwork. It'll take a little while for that to catch up. On the good news, the state revenue from FEFP and class size reduction actually is up as compared to the prior years. And another timing issue, and this is another good news issue, is the transfer of money from capital to the general fund. Um, you'll see that that is cons up considerably, and it's just because we did that transfer internally earlier this year than last year. Did want to draw your attention to the general fund. What page are you well, and we will start numbering these pages. Okay. General fund um, combined balance sheet looks like this. It's about page three of the actual financial statements. And you'll notice down towards the bottom, there's unreserved fund balance, reserve for encumbrances, and reserve for inventory. I'd like to draw your attention to the reserve for encumbrances. You'll note that in September of 12, we have $75 million reserved for encumbrances as compared to last year where it was $3.8 million. The reason for that is uh, with our new software, Skyward, we're able to encumber our payroll, which means we basically com commit our entire payroll for the year as to what we're going to be paying out. So what you see there is our payroll in there. 72.6 million of the 75 is committed for the payroll for the rest of the year. And that's, again, just new procedures with Skyward. And you'll see that also happen, it shows up again in the um, food service and special revenue funds. Other item I'd like to draw your attention to also is the self-insurance fund. Our revenues and our expenditures are down compared to the uh, previous year, and that's because of the uh, decline in number of employees participating in health insurance. Uh, we're down 144 employees participating in the health insurance. Talking to Ms. Haynes, though, particularly with the new enrollment period right now, they do see that number climbing again. Was there a reason stated for it? No. Do you have any questions? That was it. Uh, and the numbering the page is too. Yes. That would be great. <laughs> Do we anticipate anything else in food services? Any other programs, federal programs that might impact uh, the cost going up? No, not that I'm aware of. Thank you very much. Any questions from the board? The next item I have is for your approval is the budget amendment number one. It affects the general food service and capital outlay funds. 
In the general fund, you'll see there's an increase in revenue with matching increases in expenditures for five different items. These are just new revenue resources. And then we additionally have an increase in appropriations for three new units, uh, one at Forest Ridge, the kindergarten teacher, the site helper at WTI, and a guidance secretary at Citrus Springs Elementary. Food service, that was just um, an increase in their summer funding, summer feeding funding and it had a matching appropriations also. Capital projects, we have an increase in uh, utility expenditure, and those are it. And remind me that the summer feeding program will cover what people? It was for the programs out of the, I think they were primarily at the elementary schools. I think we have three schools participating. Renaissance. Okay, and, and what people can go to the summer feeding program? What is that for? I believe they're open to air anyway. Open. Yeah. That, that's what I thought, but I just wanted to check on if it was coming up the same way. Didn't they change the ESD summer program so they wouldn't have to provide lunch this year? They were changing the hours. But the number of students who participated? They just put it in one school. We just moved it all. Okay. All to which school? Preston. Preston. Board, they have a motion. I move approval of budget amendment number one. Second. It's been moved by Ms. Deutschman, seconded by Mr. Kennedy to approve budget amendment number one, September 2012. Further discussion? Yeah, I have a question. Did you say um, this new unit said kindergarten first grade, or the, that's one unit? Was that a split unit at four, four Street? Yeah, it was a class size reduction unit that was mm -hmm. put up there, and they probably combined with the class unit. Okay. So they had more enrollment than they had anticipated, or at least at those grade levels? Yes, right. And there was a, the site helper, where is that? WTI, those were the main site helpers. They probably had more kids. So you had After school? Yeah. Okay. Uh, ratios. Okay. Other questions? Ready for a vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Carries by zero. Thank you. And when you were talking about it, I was thinking about what this, as they were saying about the uh, population down in South Florida and wondering how did they do this? Not well. Not well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, class size amendment? No, uh, being able to deal with all the children. There was a huge influx and no time to do anything. And, uh, yeah, and it would be part of the class. How do you, how do you do Double with sessions, it? right? I, I grew up in Fort Lauderdale. Double sessions. Yeah. <laughs> For a long time. That was a little aside. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'd like to request approval of instructional support recommendations as outlined on the Golden Rod. <coughs> Move to approve. Second. It's been moved by uh, Mr. Murray, seconded by Mrs. Deutschman to approve the instructional support recommendations. Discussion? I always ask this question. We have all these teachers that are getting supplements for ESOL. Do we have this many students that are requiring ESOL assistance, or is it just that these are teachers that got certified and are entitled to a supplement? They're required. They have to have one student, at least one student in class, as well as a certification to receive the supplement. So we have this many students that are ELL students? Yes, that is correct. Yes, and we verify that through Skyward. We go into Skyward and make sure that they have a student and they have the certification. Okay. But just because you got the certification doesn't mean you get paid. Right. That's, yeah. That's correct. And anybody also that is the facilitator of ESOL at that school, as long as they have that certification, they also receive the funds for overseeing the program at the school. But for verification, is this not a required supplement as opposed to a optional supplement? I, it's I, contractual. It's contractual. Yes. Okay. There's 19 at Forest Ridge? That is correct. We do have that many students. We did verify that. That is correct. That has always been a big population for ESOL. When, when Forest Ridge was built, Center Springs used to have that large of a population, and now it is Forest Ridge. But sometimes the definition of ESOL, too, because if someone is thinking these are non-English speaking totally, if that's not the case. Maybe, would you share the definition of what an ESOL student is? Well, so? I'm <laughs> sorry, Mr. Bishop. I was actually the facilitator at Rural City Elementary for two years with ESOL, and that is correct. It's not always the non-English speaking students. We place them in the ESOL program. They usually are there 
two years and then we look at staffing them out. They have to pass two tests. We look, we look at the FCAT of the third through fifth grade. We place them based on the IPT test and then there is the CELA test so they have to take two tests to test out of a test out of BESOL and one being the CELA which is very similar to the FCAT. We have a facilitator that, that gives the CELA testing and so usually it's a minimum of two years is what we look at. They can be in the program for longer. We also monitor those students. Let me ask you, if I came to school and I, and I uh, my family, my mother and father spoke French and English and I spoke fluent English, but I could speak French, would you put me in an ESOL class? They have to check one of the three boxes. We have three boxes. Is there another language spoken in the home? Is there another language primary? We look at one of those three boxes if they check yes. Now I can give you a case in which we had one check yes. I called the parent because I knew that the English was a primary language. I knew that the parents were Americans. They grew up here and the child watched Dora, the Explorer. So she knew a little Spanish. So we made we made that call. I have made calls, but if they come in, they check that, that yes, there is another language, then we I give, give them the IPT test or the facilitator at the school gives them the IPT test to see if they qualify to be in the ESOL program and then we sent a letter to the parents stating yes they qualified for ESOL or no they did. But I wouldn't necessarily be would have to be placed in that poll. No that is correct. Uh, we, we do it based on testing. We provide testing and, and as I said if we're not sure that a child they should have marked yes on the box and some parents get confused I make the phone call or the facilitator made the phone call to, to, to make sure that they were checking the correct box. Okay, so it has to be a student who's having some issues with the language. If they, if when they come in, they fill out a home language survey when they come into school, and if they check yes on one of the three boxes, then we give them the IPT test. And they can I'm, be tested out. But. They can be tested in or to out. Or, or out. Or once they're in, then we have to. They have to pass two tests to to get to be dismissed from the program. Okay, but when they check the box and they're tested, they can be tested at that moment out? They, yes ma'am, okay. yes ma'am, they can be tested. We have had, I have had that case where I've given them the IPT and they scored above and they did not qualify for the ESOL program, yes that's okay, correct. Yeah, that's yes. One. But if they're not proficient, how long do they have to master the language in order to have to take FCAT? They have a year. I thought, and, and of course exams, same thing. I am not sure about the end of course, but I know for the FCAT they have a, they have a year. Yes, and that, and, that, and that is a big struggle because we had a student come in and he did he did not have to take the reading portion, he had to take the math, but that is very, they have to read it to them in English, and so that is very difficult for some of those students. Yeah, I think in the end of course exam, they're not allowed to have an interpreter or a dictionary. So you have students that come that in. That is correct. They can have as English, whatever their other, their native language is dictionary but they cannot interpret for them. I had to make that very clear to for one of our students last year and it was very difficult. And you just said they could have the dictionary? They could they can have an English, let's say Spanish dictionary as long as it's approved, yes, or an English and whatever their native language is. Yes. Miss Susie, any of this teachers that are coming fresh out of college at this point, um, is uh, ESOL certification that's already built ESOL. into it? They, they do have, we are finding that they have ESOL when they come. So conceivably in, in the past, I know where a lot of a lot of our veterans teachers had to go back to get certification. All new yes, teachers. Exactly. <laughs> they are yes, coming. I hear that at home too, Ms. Bryant. <laughs> they are coming with the ESOL They come with that. So, that is, so is that not becoming then part of a standard? It will eventually, we will, yes, we will have less teachers. Now, if once they take 60 hours, once they take, or a, it's two classes, once they take two sessions, they can take the subject area exam for ESOL, and they don't have to complete the 300 hours. So a lot of our teachers have, to, have opted for that. But Mr. Kennedy, you classes. sort of implying that uh, if it's part of a uh, program for graduating teachers, then it should not be part of a supplemental? Is that well, that's the question we right. brought up in the past about supplements, is if this is becoming a standard that, uh, that our teachers that are coming out of school, this is part of their, uh, their certification, their normal certification, typically the, the, the uh, uh, supplement is because they've gone above and beyond what is expected of that. But now if, if the majority of the teachers coming out, that's what's being expected of them in their certification, I'm trying to understand what, what is the purpose of the supplement? Because usually it's for 
because we need to have somebody in those fields to get those certifications, which was initially my understanding why we did it. Now, everyone's coming out with them. I mean, the yeah, list, we, like Ms. Deutschman is saying, this is a big list of certification. So, um, yes, we still have some that are, they don't receive the supplement if they're out of field, but we still have several that are out of field still for ESOL that are still working on that, on receiving their ESOL certification. Mr. Blocker, round numbers. I, for some reason, I want to say it was near $400,000 in supplements. In total for all supplements? Yeah. Athletic and education, mm -hmm. it's over a million. It's over a million. ESOL, do you happen to know what that one is? No, I don't have any. That's okay. I just and I didn't, I didn't add up the numbers, but it's $514. Per? Per. That's correct, for the year. They receive it at one time. I, I just think that that becomes, as we know we're going to have some challenges, I think we have to have that conversation again. And you concerning the teachers, the new teachers coming in who have already had that part of their uh, certification, not concerning the teachers who... Well, I think, I think again, it, every, that issue of supplements continues to have to come up because, yes. you know, if we're having to cut programs to meet supplements and supplements are something that is part of their basic certification now, right. I, I'm not understanding what we're doing special then. What is the need? I don't, you know, I understand a supplement when we have an in-need situation. But, I, but if it becomes the standard, then I'm, and we, again, and if I'm having to cut another program somewhere else in order to fund it, I'm concerned. Thank you. Mr. Bishop? <clears throat> Any further discussion on the instructional support recommendation? I, I notice uh, Mr. Knott uh, is going to be retiring. Our school psychologist has been with us. I don't know how many years. Do you know how many years Mr. Knott has been with us? 34 years. 34 and a half in this county. Gosh, okay. It's going to be sort of missed. Absolutely. Do we have a motion? Do we have a motion? I thought we did. Yes, we we did, okay. Yeah. We'll vote. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you so much. I'd also like to request approval for Deidre Murray, the assistant principal at Citrus Springs Middle School, with an effective date of December 3rd, 2012. Move approval. Second. It's been moved by Ms. Bryant, uh, second by Mr. Kennedy, to approve Deidre Murray as assistant principal of Citrus Springs Middle School. All in favor? All right. discussion? I just have a question yeah. for Ms. Hemel, maybe. Um, and, and we've seen this at uh, elementary school teachers now moving into the high school. High school come with those reading strategies that are highly effective at those higher grade levels. But my question is about this particular. Um, uh, recommendation is uh, I can't see that she certified anything oh. other than elementary school. Do we not require certification in that grade level? She's been a, um, a teacher on special commerce curriculum at Crystal Middle School for several years. Right, but she, it said her certification was in um, grades kindergarten through six, six, I think, K through six. Exceptional student education K through 12. Well, this is not an ESE teacher, she's going to be assistant principal. And she also has a that leadership. So that's how, okay, I'm just I'm just asking because it just was kind of, uh, kind of stuck out a little bit. Um, but Ms. Deutsch, when that brings up a point I think we've talked about though in the past, and, and that does, is there different job description qualifications that, that this board wants to Maybe not today, but on another day, look at for different grade levels. Yeah. Well, we've moved. Listen, look at Mark McCoy. He's a perfect example of moving from elementary, middle, and high, and you know has been very highly adaptive at each level. But um, I don't know what his certification is. If it's K through 12 or whatever. Just a question. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Powers, I yes. know that we have a time starting at 4 o'clock, um, and after that we have Mr. Dixon's section that has to do a lot with um, discussion on policies, and all. I think people are here probably highly interested in certification of high school diplomas and sexual harassment, but <laughs> I would ask <laughs> that in the interest of, of time for them and coming to our meetings, if we could move item D5 to the front of that list to um, address before we get into the policy discussion. 
I have no objection. I don't know, but I know some people are coming later uh, to listen to. We don't have a time certain for this issue. It's on the agenda. Is there a time certain? Oh, no, no. I thought you meant the reply to it. No, just for Mr. Dixon's discussion. Oh, yes, that's mm -hmm. fine. That's absolutely fine. Board members. Uh, this particular item is uh, for discussion and for direction. And as you know, uh, the issue of school concurrency came up in April, and Mr. Catero and members of the Builders Association approached the board to place this on the agenda for your discussion. And at that time, you did not indicate that you had an interest in eliminating school concurrency. The, it is true that the Florida legislature first required all districts and county governments to enter into interlocal agreement and have concurrency as part of that interlocal agreement for public school facility planning. Now that is optional. Most of the districts that I'm aware of have chosen to keep it in place because there's really, as Mr. Bradshaw and I both stated in the past, no benefit to a school district not to have concurrency. And for the life of me, I really can't understand, you know, why it's, a, it's such an issue. But nonetheless, um, the county has uh, drafted a, a uh, document that strikes concurrency when that came back to us uh, with also the, uh, the additional request to have an impact fee moratorium before we entered into any further discussions at the staff level. We wanted to bring that to the board's attention and get your direction on those matters. Mr. Dixon, I want to ask you, um, since concurrency began in Citrus County, or for the last 10 years, how many developments or developers have been denied or had their projects adjusted due to school board concurrency? There have been no developments that have been delayed, denied, or had any additional requirements placed on them because of concurrency. So there's been no economic change and I believe we've had probably the largest construction period um, growth over that same period of time. Well, the concurrency requirement came into place in 2006 when the agreement uh, was being uh, adopted. So since it's been in place, we have had a handful of requests for concurrency determinations and none of them have required any additional uh, payments or land dedications or anything on the part of the developer. When was the last time that a developer came to that we needed to sit down with to adjust concurrency? Well, we, we had a request for a concurrency, preliminary concurrency determination a couple of months ago for a project that had originally been approved and they're going to make some adjustments to it and there were no concerns. We had no concerns. No concerns. No concern. If um, we did not get funded for through impact fees and we needed to exercise concurrency, how would that protect the Ivalorum taxpayer? Well, con concurrency is simply a mechanism to know where you are in terms of de the development and the impact from that development. It gives us the ability to monitor the permit activity or the platting of new subdivisions, the creation of new lots, not individual units, because individual units are already vested and do not require concurrency determination. A con con concurrency determination only kicks in when they're platting a new subdivision are building a new residential project of sufficient size that it has a number of units that could impact our school system. So if a subdivision wanted to get created in North Crystal River near, let's say, a port, and we were going to create or there was going to be a creation of some new school uh, stations that would come out of that, and we currently didn't have enough funds within our impact fee <coughs> reserves to accommodate that, it would provide us then a discussion at the table to make sure that we're not going to have to hit the Aguilar taxpayers to actually build such stations. It would basically give us the opportunity to first know that the project is occurring at the early stage so that we can plug it into our five-year work plan because typically a project that's going to generate enough students to go beyond what our capacity is 
is going to be something that we need to know about so that we have ample time to prepare for it. And it wouldn't necessarily mean that we would be entitled to any additional funds above and beyond you know, what the impact fees are, already would require. It would just mean we would know about it sooner and that we would have a mechanism to ensure that it was paid and the land dedication possibly would be made sooner rather than later in the process. And if we changed what we currently have as far as the mechanism for concurrency with our local agreement, we would have to then renegotiate with the other three entities, Crystal River, Inverness, and the county, and we would need to spend the staff time with that document negotiating that and, and rewording it if we were even considering it. Mr. Dixon, we're giving you the, the time, sir, and, and uh, I don't want to miss any of this conversation, so cool. right at that point, yep. it's a breaking point, and then after the presentation, then would you come back up and give me a shot? Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have tobacco prevention with Melissa Wood from the Citizens County Health Department. My name is Melissa Wood. I'm a health educator with the Citrus County Health Department and the Tobacco Prevention Program. Um, thank you for having us here today. Uh, tobacco Free Florida is a grant-based program um, that works throughout the state to prevent youth and adult um, tobacco use as well as offers cessation services throughout the community. Um, tobacco Free Florida recommends that every school board within the state include 12 comprehensive tobacco-free policies. Uh, Citrus County currently has eight out of the 12 policies included. However, the four that we are missing are, uh, the first is schools may not accept gifts, including curriculum from tobacco companies. Um, the second is a plan to communicate the policy to students, staff, and visitors must be outlined. Um, the third, an enforcement plan for staff and visitors is outlined and the fourth, an enforcement plan for staff and visitors that provides cessation resources is outlined. Um, we are currently working with the Citrus County Library System to offer cessation classes on a monthly basis in all Citrus County libraries to make it very um, accessible to all members of, of our community. Um, today, we have a student from Inverness Middle School who is currently running for student body president, and one of her platforms is uh, tobacco prevention in the school and getting a SWAT program um, in all of our schools in Citrus County. So she has a few words. If you would just give her a couple minutes of your time, um, I'd like to introduce Cassidy Lundy. Good afternoon, Citrus County School Board members. I'm Cassidy Lundy, a student at Inverness Middle School. One of the most important things to me is that tobacco fully and completely stays out of our schools. My reason for this is I lost one of the most important people in my life to the use of tobacco. My pop-up was a humorous, intelligent guy who could take a car apart then put it back together. Because of tobacco, this world lost a very important person and so did I. Things about my school have come to my attention. One of them being that our schools in Citrus County don't come to full potential of stopping tobacco use. None of our middle schools, including Lacanto High School, does not have SWAT. SWAT stands for Students Working Against Tobacco. Bringing SWAT into our schools would certainly help prevent the use of tobacco in Citrus County. SWAT makes their appearance known at different county events. We also need to enforce no tobacco usage on school campuses. I, being a social person and very involved in school spirit, often attend sport games, one being football. Out of the many times I've gone to a football game, I have never noticed a sign stating that it is a tobacco-free zone. I have seen no food or drinks are allowed to be brought into the football stands or fields, but never about tobacco. Which do you think is more important? While sliding into my next point, our school rules do not say that tobacco companies such as Marble or Camel cannot sponsor our school or school events. Which brings me to another question. Do you want our school, our county schools, to be seen as tobacco supporters? Tobacco is a huge problem in the state of Florida, well in America for that matter, but can you imagine what we could do if we could prevent tobacco use in schools starting in grades as low as pre-K? Making tobacco prevention is a big deal and would mean a great deal to me. Thank you for letting me speak today and thank you for your time. 
Thank you. Um, I just wanted to briefly touch on each of the components that um, Ms. Wood uh, was talking about earlier. Um, the first one, uh, presenting the, um, or the school board currently um, has in their uh, school board policy that there's no advertisements of tobacco products. However, it's just a matter of wording as far as gifts, sponsorships, and things like that. So I don't, I don't foresee that to be an, any problem. Um, the second one, the second component is a plan to outline um, a communication to uh, students, staff, visitors. And again, that's, that's relatively simple. You know, we can fix that with signs. Um, pretty much it just has to be outlined. Um, the third thing is it's kind of in grouped with the fourth. It's enforcement and cessation resources. Pretty much we already have something in the school board policies that is for students. You know, they get the citation class. However, there's nothing explicitly outlined for staff, employees, contractors, or visitors. So all we're asking is that I've already drafted something uh, that maybe you guys would like to look at at a later date, but it pretty much has like a first offense, second offense, stuff like that, and it's just like warnings, you know, nothing, you know, not a citation, nothing like that, just verbal warnings. We would, would just ask that that be outlined in the school board policies. And if you'll just give me one second. Um, I just wanted to reiterate why stuff like this is important. Um, exposure to secondhand tobacco, even a little secondhand smoke, is dangerous. It is a known carcinogen which causes cancer. As little as 30 minutes of exposure to secondhand smoke can affect the coronary arteries of, health and young, of healthy young smokers. According to the 2012 Florida Youth Tobacco Survey, as many as 22.3 of youth from ages 11 to 17 reporting having, having asthma, and that's in Citrus County. We are currently above the state, state's average. So reducing secondhand smoke uh, it, it can lower the amount of asthma triggers in our schools. Um, and also, it's just a positive adult role modeling for students. It's, cri it's critical to send a message to our youth that is consistent with the tobacco use prevention curriculum that is taught in our classrooms. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We just want to maybe you can get up with uh, Mr. Dixon, who preceded you, who uh, does policy for the schools, uh, to discuss your concerns. Maybe you and he could uh, set a time to talk, and, and perhaps Mr. Clava could add some information to having been at the school school sites and having knowledge of that. So I'll ask if maybe you two could get together, maybe next week or the following week. I, I apologize for not for not introducing Liz. Wood. she's our tobacco prevention specialist, um, and we work hand in hand um, at tobacco prevention. So I apologize for not introducing her. But, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for your concern. I have a place for you to start. <laughs> right outside this door. <laughs> we have the strangest problem. So you can't smoke on WTI. So they walk across the street and they smoke on our property here. Then the hospital is a smoke-free zone. Guess where the employees smoke? Inverness Primary School. At Inverness Primary School, right at the front door. Um, and I've chased him off. I know Mrs. Himmel has, we've asked the hospital, please uh, enforce, you know, make, the, make them understand that we're also a, a what did you say? <laughs> Mr. Bradshaw was a trespass. We are, we are currently working um, with CMH and actually tomorrow we're doing a, a huge promotion, or not tomorrow, it's, uh, Thursday is, is the uh, Great American Smoke Out. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Um, so they, they are currently working on making it a lot tougher for employees to smoke while they're at work and plus we're really trying to get in there and and help them to quit altogether and really take us up on the opportunity because the cessation classes that tobacco free florida offers are completely free and that does include nrts which is nicotine replacement therapy the patches the gum the lozenges so it's just a matter of making a phone call and being on the phone for 10 to 15 minutes um, giving them some information and you know it could it could give you several several years of your life. <laughs> so um, we're hoping that that more CMH employees and and people of Citrus County in general will will take us up on that offer. And our grandpas that we all miss who died because they smoked. I have two my father. Um, and those signs IPS first. We just tell you exactly where to put them. We, we, you know, we're, we're happy to provide all of the schools. We actually just ordered some. Homosassa Elementary School called us 
asked us if we would bring some signs. We ordered them that day, and as soon as we get them in, we're going to bring them over to them. So we're we're happy to um, you know paint the school with signs as many as you want. We'll we'll bring them over. And we, we do we have, have signs. signs. We had a parent a few years ago email me about parents smoking in the cars and dropping the kids off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we started at a couple of schools, so we'll get with you on that too. But we started a couple of schools where we put that sign in the line where parents are waiting on their kids about smoking. How long with donkey on your cell phone when you're negotiating between the kindergarten and walking in the school? Absolutely, yes. And that's why I mentioned Mr. Clark, because I know he has knowledge of which schools have what, and maybe you could direct on that. And we really appreciate you bringing this to us, because we're certainly supportive of what you said. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Dixon. Yes. Mr. Kennedy, you all were discussing. <laughs> That's okay. I'll tell you, I, there's another big question, and, and let me go there. Um, the, the Board of County Commissioners sent you a letter and for uh, so that we can make sure this is clear. That letter was sent on approximately what date? Both letters were received around Halloween. So, uh, they so because there was, as we know, some uh, comments that we, uh, that uh, we received the letter. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that, that that letter was received um, and we sat on it and I think it needs to be uh, clear that we received that letter and acted uh, promptly and this is the first time this board has convened since that letter was received. That's correct. And I would also add to that, we did discuss this in April. That's and what I was so going to say. so why would a county commission on their own direct their staff to redraft a policy that is specifically and only for the school board when we haven't even had the opportunity to reiterate that we, what we had said in April, which is we didn't have any interest in doing that, why would they just do it for us? I, I just don't understand what's going on. Do it. No, I, I can appreciate that. I did go back and look at the video from the commission meetings. And I didn't see the direction to go back and strike all of the concurrency provisions from the interlocal agreement well, on I behalf think, of the school board. I think um, Ms. Collins told us that's what happened. Is that what you said? There is backup in your packet. And uh, Mr. Williams is here. You can probably better respond. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which gives you... Well, I, I I've seen the motion of what the, the commissioners voted on, yes. but I can tell you I've talked to the commissioners and I think there was confusion as to what they said. Because they were not under the impression, I think, that we were actually that they were actually stating that. So when we were, and I, and that was after we received your backup. Uh, Eric Williams, I'm the director of uh, Geographic Resources and Community Planning for the county. Um, on September 25th, the Board of County Commissioners made a motion um, to direct staff uh, to. Uh, pursue the removal of concurrency um, in the school element from the comprehensive plan and work with school board staff accordingly. They did not make the statement of the moratorium on impact fees, which may be the confusing point that has arisen in the past. Um, the letters that were sent were on the 23rd and on the 25th. Um, Excuse 27th. me, so let me just ask you, was, were, was staff, did you give any direction or explanation to the Board of County Commissioners that in April we had already said we weren't doing it. I, I did not know. I was but are you aware if the commissioners had ever received that? I'm aware. I because I think that's where this board has struggled, is that the commissioners are coming to us and saying that they're going to strike something that we'd already in April said we weren't going to do. Understandable. Just acting as staff is directed by uh, our board through administration. That's what prompted the two letters that were sent to Mr. Dixon. What prompted? The the direction from the Board of County Commission to proceed working with school board staff to remove concurrency from the local agreement and to remove the school element from the comprehensive plan and to work with school board staff as well on impact fees. Why would one say school board staff, though? It's uh, county commissioners and the school board that had the say on this. I'm just repeating what was in the minutes from the, the county board. commission. <laughs> 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 the trouble, too, I, I think that some of us on the school board have is that for the last two impact fee cycles, when you bring up 
discussion of impact fees. Um, the engineer and consultant that was hired by the Board of County Commissioners recommended an amount that then the Board of County Commissioners cut in half. Based on the recommendation of your own staff member. So we have more than once, including the last time, all of us went to the Board of County Commissioners and said, don't do that. So I think we've made it pretty clear on this board that we want, after the consultant's recommendation, we want them adopted at the 100%. And that's where we stand. And if you need specific direction, I will tell you that this board member is saying, we absolutely will continue to maintain concurrency because that's in the best interest of our students, schools, and ad valorem taxpayer. And you cannot show us one bit of information that shows us that removing concurrency has any economic positive impact to this community. And the school board as a whole is saying it's not one or two members, the whole of the school board voted on this. I can only speak for me. Thank you, Ms. No, I, I wanted to make it clear it's not just one or two people at the whole of the school board. As no. Ms. Collins said earlier, our position here today, myself and Ms. Collins, is here to transmit that information back to back to uh, our administration and staff to be directed to the board. Well, we're, we're also at 50% impact fee when other, other entities are not. So as far as our reaching out to the community, I think we've done more than our fair share um, uh, by being reduced by 50% of what we were entitled to above parks and libraries and the other things that were funded at 100%. Um, and the words of Spike Fitzpatrick, God rest his soul, he wanted us to get whatever anybody else got. If you cut everybody else by 50%, then that'll be fine. But don't pick and choose. You know, the other issue about this concurrency, this is based, I think, on the whim of our governor. Um, growth management kind of being dismantled throughout the whole state, um, almost mm -hmm. across the board overnight. And can't um, speak for the governor's office. I know you can't, <laughs> but it was a, there was a very interesting article in one of, I don't know if it was a local paper or, or, or maybe the Wall Street Journal that talked about um, there was a meeting of the last five or six governors except for uh, Governor Bush. And they talked about um, Florida and Florida's future. And without exception, Republicans and Democrats alike said this new lack of growth management was the worst thing that has ever happened to Florida. Worst. So my guess is that this is going to be a small window when we're not going to have growth management. And hopefully in the future, we will have come back to our senses and understand that we have to protect our environment. And we have to protect our communities, and we have to protect our quality of life, because that's really what it's all about. Um, you, you all are from South Florida. I, I stood in line with my husband at Kendall to buy a house in the strawberry field. So you know exactly the impact of that. And then also the second uh, boat lift, what happened? People fled. <coughs> as far as they could drive in a day and still reasonably get back to work in Miami, that's where Boca Raton went overnight from a little sleepy community to you know, their sprawl from Dade County. So, you know, a hurricane that, that hit uh, Hillsborough County would impact us by people moving here. You can't predict the future. We've always said that about impact fees and concurrency. You cannot predict the future, so you have to protect the future. That's what this was put in place for. So that's my opinion. And you know, this board's responsibility and mission is to help Citrus County's economic situation is to have high quality schools and to make sure we have exceptional learning classrooms. That is what we have done successfully well. We are one of only three districts in the state next year that even qualifies to be a high performing district and a big part of that is because of our sound, prudent, financial, economic stability that we have brought to our district. It isn't just our student scores. And we're not getting there when we have commissioners with their staff come to us and ask to remove concurrency, which will again have no economic impact to our community. And then wants to have a conversation about removing impact fees, which only potentially take a reserve away. One question, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dixon, it's been stated that we have nothing in our five-year plan that impact fees will pay for. Is that correct? 
we have one project that we are currently using impact fees to pay for, and that is in conjunction with an interlocal agreement for County Road 486 road improvements. There's 200 and something thousand dollars in this year's. And is that as, do we even currently have that much in our reserve account from impact fees? I don't think we have that much in So if we can't fund that road improvement that way, which I believe the Board of County Commissioners have already voted for, How's that money going to get there? Who's going to pay for it? I would assume it would come from the county because we agreed. Which would be the Avalorum taxpayer. New ta a tax. So tax. It's, going to come, it's going to come from the Avalorum yeah. property taxpayer. Plus, how much have we lost in capital outlay funds in the last three years, Mr. Blocker? $20 million or more? At least. Yeah, at least. So, you know, the county gets to levy their taxes. We don't get to levy our taxes. And we've had the taxes that we could levy taken away. So, you know, we're really at a great disadvantage, much more so than we've ever been historically, uh, at least in my memory. And we've used impact fees to build new schools, and um, uh, we're at 50%. We're at zero for PICO funds. We're at zero for, for classroom for whatever that. Classroom for Yeah, and um, we're down at least 25% or more on our um, two mills. And kids don't come in nice packages of 18, 22, and 24. But when we had our, our most recent facilities, our um, planning and facilities audit, one of the things that the auditor noted was that we need to look to local sources for funding capital projects and recommended looking at things and, uh, and, uh, and said it was good that we were using in, uh, impact fees as part of our formula for capital projects. So, I mean, it's a local source of revenue. We're already getting it. There's no benefit to the building industry to do away with it. If anything, just the opposite, because it ensures that infrastructure is going to be in place when it's needed. And with a ad valorem tax base that's declining or, or, or just starting to come back up, it doesn't make any sense to eliminate it. Mr. Dixon, how, um, when an impact fee is paid for and it's built and infrastructure is built, how long is that infrastructure um, that that money is to take care of that infrastructure for what length of time? When an impact fee is levied, it's levied for the life of the unit, which is typically 50 years, considered 50 years. So it's not necessarily for the family that moves in there when it's first built, but it's for the life cycle of that unit. And for example, in Beverly Hills, and I'm thinking of the newer sections of Beverly Hills, there was arguments made at the time that impact fees were collected on retirement homes, but we've seen the largest growth of our schools has been in Beverly Hills when those retirees have moved out of those homes and families have moved in either through a rental or through a purchase. That's correct. Mr. Bradshaw, should we make a motion to reject the proposed um, amendments to the impact to the concurrency law or not? Do you need us to direct um, you or Mr. Dixon to send a letter back to the commissioner stating that we had no intention of changing our position on concurrency? I think you have to remind yourself, Board, that we just, uh, the people of this community turned down our proposal for 0.25 meals, which was in all actuality, not an increase in taxes, although it looked like it. And so over the next four years, we're going to lose approximately another $9 million uh, for running this school district. And so I think we have to look at everything. That, that one is going to hurt us, folks. Absolutely. This, that 2.2 mil, or that $2.2 million is really going to hurt us. I think people have to understand now where this board is coming from. We have taken. 10, 12 million dollars out of our reserves, Mr. Blocker, over the last four or five years to maintain what we're currently doing, to make this a great school district. That's gone. We have no more anymore. We have said by board policy we will keep three and a half percent in our unfunded reserves, and we're at 4.02 or something like that. Is that right? Okay, so we're we got a cushion of six hundred thousand dollars. That's nothing right now. $600,000 on that level, 
we're in we're in a world of serious hurt right now. So I think what you have to look at is all avenues of whether you have your income and your outgoing and your expenses and what you have to do. I don't have a dog in this fight anymore, so I can say what I want to say to you. Uh, basically, that's that's the way I think you have to look at. But it is for the kids of what we're going to do. We have halted projects. We have halted phase three at, at uh, Chris River because we don't have that kind of money. Although we'd like to finish that project, that we don't know where that's going to come from. So we're going to have to wait and see on what we can do. But when you go and people don't realize that that two million dollars every year, and especially on the structural side or the is that what I want to call it? Mm -hmm. Okay, that that would have been for instruct instruction. That could have been for personnel. That could have been for a lot of things. That we we're going to wipe that two million off the board. The superintendent, the next school board was going to have to come up and find out where they can do with that two million. Folks, I, I'm, I'm not a naysayer, but you got two areas that you can cut, and that's people and programs. And the state won't let us cut people because of our class classroom size amendment. So well, you know, last support people. I mean, there's a lot. We we went through that whole budget thing all last year. Came up with a list of cuts, and no one wanted to, no one wanted to, to, to enforce them. So. Well, we're a high achieving district, and you don't want to not be a high achieving district. So you're trying to do the best you can, but if you keep cutting, 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 where do you turn? Just like Mr. Murray said, when you turn to people or programs, and when you compare us to the surrounding communities. We well outperform them. This is a reason if you have children why you want to move to Citrus County. You know, when we say that, I was thinking when I first started teaching, we had an exceptionally good school. And the, at that time, the enrollment of elementary school 350. When we completed the year, closed the doors for the summer, and opened the doors for the fall, we had 700. We signed up. Well, you know, you don't have over 700 kids in the 350 school, so we had to open up a school that had closed down. and work at that school until a new classrooms could be built. Citrus County has an exceptional school system. And every time I, when we all say something about Miami, I think, oh my heavens, we're gonna be faced with that same situation I was 30 years ago, where we have you know, 700 and space for 300. It's a bit scary. For clarification though, can, I'm sorry. Um, you don't have any objection to updating the data in the interlocal agreement because we did we did tell them that we would proceed with that and we have Mr. Dixon can you explain to you with that because there's again been comments said that we are not following the interlocal agreement that we do not provide on an annual basis um, the capital improvement um, data which I do know we do and uh, and that the data is not being updated regularly as as per the agreement can you can you speak to that well we we need to update the information in the data but it's not going to make that that much difference because it's a 10-year average for but does that require that to be done annually that the update on the data that i'm not sure if it is we need to change that because updating it annually serves no purpose other than making everybody chase their tail around in a circle all the time because it doesn't change that much to to be necessary to update it annually as far as the uh, Capital improvement. Capital improvements. We provide the county with a copy of our uh, five-year work plan every year as soon as it's adopted, as well as the two cities. And, and isn't that also uploaded to the state's computer as well? Yes. So if they can get it any time they want to look at it, and they can go all the way back to um, you know ten years ago, I think. I'm just asking also, in a course of a conversation we had a few months back, maybe a year. What were the impact fees? Do those impact fees come directly to us? No, when the impact fees are levied, they go to the county Commission. and they go into a trust fund. And then when we use them, we have to get our projects approved <coughs> as being impact fee fundable. And then we have to pay for that project and then be reimbursed. And who's the custodial again of all of the impact fee money? The Board of County Commissioners. Thank you. You know, one thing that troubles me about all this is that when we have a uh, board of county commissioners and the school board, uh, and if we have concerns, we should be talking with each other. There shouldn't be 
uh, emails going back and forth, or letters going back and forth, or missiles going back and forth, whatever. We should be face to face discussing whatever the issue is. And, uh, and well, I'm Ms. Powers, we have for well, four years. I understand. This board, even before me, I have watched as we you had all meetings. went before them. We have had meetings. You've yes. sent you you sent Ms. Deutschman. I remember a couple of years ago before the impact fees discussion, and it went over pretty ridiculous. I mean, we they they well, approved it at fifty percent. The county commissioners, the school board, we are servants of the people. We are to do what's best for the community, for best for the people, and it's built as best for the children. Absolutely. And we should be sitting face to face discussing that and nothing else. Egos, whatever it is, out, out the door, we sit there and do what's best for this community. And I want to see that happen. I do not want to see this kind of thing go on where we, we read about something in the newspaper and are saying, what? what letter? What are you talking about? We don't know. We should always know. So you're basically okay with updating the data? definitely don't want to eliminate concurrency and on the matter of impact fee moratorium you, you're, you're all against a moratorium on impact fees as I understand that's it. correct that's, and not the, I think the whole board as they're not going there all of us have stated we this. thought that it would have a positive impact economic impact but even Vince Catero went on record with uh, Commissioner Bates and said there's not one study, there's not one time in his 20-something years that lowering impact fees increases construction permits. And I think they're finding that out in Hernando County currently, so uh, we'll make a note of that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Thank you. Yes. Are y'all directing the letter you sent back? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll take a ten-minute break. <clears throat>